Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. How are you going? Good, thanks, Owen. Good to be back for our very first Share Deep Dive episode. Yeah, so we're going to dive deep, well, kind of deep, as quickly as we can into one ASX company, as by voted by our community. Um, they have chosen a company, which we probably didn't expect them to pick. Do you remember some of the other companies that were on our poll inside the Facebook community? Yeah, I believe it was Appen, AGL Energy, A2 Milk, Zip, and Fortescue Metals Group. And so we picked uh, the five most popular companies off RAS Media um, during September and polled our Facebook community. And the winner by quite a mile was Fortescue Metals. Fortescue. Okay. So this is the company that trades under the ticket code FMG. So if you typed into Google ASX space FMG, you would see all the articles for Fortescue Metals Group started by um, a billionaire by the name of Andrew Twiggy Forrest. Um, There are many great books. I've read a book um, of Twiggy. Um, It's actually titled Twiggy. Uh, It's a fantastic book, which dives deep into his life before Fortescue, his family life, his heritage, and also then his time um, starting Fortescue. So before we start, Kate, let's make a note. Okay, so this is uh, not a recommendation from myself or Owen (laughs) for Fortescue or the RAS team. I don't believe, uh, apart from our RAS media site covering news of Fortescue, we've ever covered uh, Fortescue on any of our platforms. Um, and yeah, we've caught, covered the news, but that's it. Yeah, Nothing from a research yeah. perspective. Yeah. And oh no, I don't own any sh- individual shares. Uh, obviously, Fortescue is a really big company, so it's in most of the uh, large ASX 200 ETFs. So we've got indirect exposure through super funds and ETFs, but we don't own any individual positions. And chances are, if you have an industry super fund like Host Plus, Australian Super, Rest, any of those, in some tiny little way, Fortescue might actually make up part of your wealth too. So this yeah. is a really interesting company. Um, A200, VDHG, okay. you've all got some Fortescue in there. Yes. And those are two things that I do own, VDHG ETF and the A200 ETF, Kate. So do you own those two? No, no, they were just the, the ones that came to mind. Oh, it's the two that came to mind, which two that I own, and they um, would be in some way invested in Fortescue. Okay. So Let's get into it then. What is Fortescue, Kate? Can you give us like the 30,000 foot view of what is Fortescue? Yeah. So Fortescue, $45 billion market cap at the time of recording on the 13th of October. So humongous company. I think it was the 11th largest company by market cap when I looked the other day as in Australia. So it is a huge business. And so Fortescue's Metals Group, it's an Australian-based company operating in Australia and their main job over the last decade or so has been iron ore mining. And so that's why it's a more of an interesting choice for the podcast, because we often talk about technology companies and entertainment companies and things like that. I mean, our last um, share series was on Disney. So this is a world apart from that. But Fortescue is focused on exploration, development, production, processing, and the sale of iron ore. So they have the, they pretty much own the whole supply chain from the boats to the pipelines to the train that transports it because there's a lot of logistics involved in uh, digging up iron ore and sending it to its customers that we'll dive into. And so um, the more I looked at Fortescue, the more interesting it was actually. Yeah, so it's not just a thing like an organization that digs stuff out of the ground. It's kind of everything from there to basically how does it get to its customers and its customers, um, I think... 91% 91% or more of it of them are actually Chinese customers. Um, so basically from e- everyone from the hole in the ground in WA to dropping it off a, at a port in China, that whole process is basically controlled by Fortescue. 
um, for the most part, you know, they do use some other resources from other parties, but for the most part, it's controlled by Fortescue. So that means ships, trains, trucks, you know, uh, loaders, everything that you can imagine, engineers, explosives, you name it, they do it. Um, and that is Fortescue. So just, um, I guess maybe people are wondering, you know, we hear about um, iron, so, you know, iron ore and things like that in the news. Kate, just at a very high level, what is iron ore used for? Yeah. So before preparing for this podcast, uh, I don't know if this is a bad thing because it's such a large company in Australia, but I really had no idea what Fortescue and some of its um, mining counterparts like BHB and Rio Tinto I knew they were in mining and I knew there was a lot going on in Western Australia and I'd heard that about the fact that it generated a lot of jobs and um, associated housing prices and everything, but I didn't really know much about what they were digging up, what iron ore was and what iron ore was used for. So to give you a little crash course, if you don't know, which uh, I didn't either, so here we go. Um, iron ore, it's their rocks and minerals um that can be dug up and they can be used to make steel and iron or iron is actually one of the most abundant rock forming elements in our crust and so iron was actually first discovered in Australia by an explorer in the middle back ranges in South Australia and it's actually really commonly found in Australia and 90 percent of the identified iron resources actually are found in Western Australia, which is why we've got so much um, industry in terms of mining in Western Australia. And the other company, country involved in mining um, that has a lot of iron ore to find is also in Brazil. And that's probably another company that will mention Vale, who uh, does a lot in the iron ore industry in Brazil. And the main thing we use iron ore for, 98% of it is to make steel. And so that was quite interesting because I was like, oh, well, what do we use all this steel for? And steel is actually used to make cars, ships, uh, buildings. So a lot of it in China was used to sort of help fund their construction boom. And so um, they wanted a lot of steel for that. But like really anything you can think of, a lot of things in building and infrastructure needs steel. And we use 20 times more iron in the form of steel than all other metals put together. And there's actually, I'll include it in the show notes, but the government, the Australian government has a great resource on everything to do with steel and what we use it for and everything, um, every possible use of it, like from washing machines to uh, pumps and cranes. It's quite fascinating if you want to have a look in it. Yeah. Um, What um, a big part of this is, what a big part of the iron ore kind of I guess thematic, if you can call that, they called it a super resources boom or a super cycle um, for many years. And so most of it's found in the Hammersley Ranges, which is in, uh, if you look at the map of Australia, it's in WA, it's kind of at the, the left-hand side, just off, just away from the coast in the center of WA. That's how you can kind of think about it. And this is where many of Australia's biggest uh, tycoons have made their wealth. And indeed it's kind of like an engine room of Australia's economy. So if you've heard of Gina Reinhardt, um, Andrew Twiggy Forrest, who is the founder of uh, Fortescue, we've got Rio Tinto, we've got BHP, all of these big companies have operations in this region. Um, And so this is a really lucrative industry and everything basically from, you know, I'm just looking around my room from like my computer to the bracket that holds up my bench to probably, you know, the steel that goes into the stumps. I think if you look around some of your houses, um, and you look at actually the structure, like if you have a garage or you have, I don't know, some type of steel somewhere, you'll see big obvious signs that it's that it's actually made from iron ore. Um, you'll see BHP printed in the side or, you know, Rio Tinto printed in the side of some old school pieces of steel. Um, and so this is, these are just like obvious examples, but less obvious examples of where iron ore ends up is um, particularly in Asia and China specifically, Um, as they've gone through this enormous kind of infrastructure boom. So spending on things like new cities, urban development, roads, railways, all of those different things require lots and lots of steel. Um, And so naturally companies like Fortescue, BHP, Rio Tinto and Brazil's Vale have cashed in on this. Um, I think there's a really interesting stat that come from Bill Gates' blog and it's come from quite a few years ago, but I remember it distinctly because it was so profound, which was that, um, in the three-year period, 
China used more concrete than the entire US uh, country did for 100 years. Um, and so that's just to put it in perspective of the scale at which China was building infrastructure and is to an extent still is today. And so at the end of the day, what happens in a company like Fortescue selling something like iron ore, which you said is pretty much found everywhere. I'm pretty sure if you went outside into your backyard and you dug up some dirt, there's probably a tiny speck of iron in that, or there could be some sort of mineral that could be, if you could get it at scale, could make you money. But basically the way it works with commodities is that it's just supply and demand. Companies like Fortescue supply iron ore and um, mills like steel mills and, and manufacturers in China consume that. So they're the demand. And basically the way it works is that at equilibrium, you know, at a point where supply matches demand, we should be at a kind of sustainable price for the industry. But oftentimes what happens is prices ebb and flow. And so in some instances, um, you know, maybe say in South America recently, where there is, you know, a lot of backlash or there's environmental challenges or COVID or whatever, you will find that supply can fall away, which means that there is less supply and more demand. Um, and then you can see things like if China tilts away from infrastructure spending to consumer-based spending, the demand from steel mills will go down. Or if there's environmental protections in China, maybe the the demand goes down momentarily while they adjust to the new regulatory environment. And so these imbalances in supply and demand uh, in iron ore can create huge, huge changes in the price that Fortescue gets for its products. And so we've seen that in the last two years, we've seen iron ore prices rocket and we've seen companies like Fortescue stay in business and benefit from higher prices. But you only have to go back say four or five years to see that prices were once really, really low. And so that's, just to illustrate basically how the commodities markets work. And this is not particular to iron ore. This is for anything, gold. Um, it can be for copper, lithium, basically any commodity um, can be sport and sold. There are different grades of iron ore, which I will add in and Fortescue's tends to be at the lower end of some of that, that grading, but um, it still makes a lot of money from its iron ore. Yeah. And Fortescue can only control so much. They can control their safety, the, the cost of production. They can control their supply chain, uh, but they, they can't really control the demand side of things. And so they're very reliant on uh, the external elements of the world. And this is probably where all of those macroeconomic trends do play in a bit more because you need to know I guess with, with Fortescue, um, unlike some of the other companies we look at, you do need to know a little bit about what's happening in the wider world and in the construction in some other countries and what they're up to. For sure. Kate, um, tell us a little bit about the, the kind of the team behind Fortescue. So one of the things that we look at when we're looking at companies um, is we look at the team that's behind it. We'd like to see, you know, board of directors and CEOs and management teams that are skilled. They have ownership in the companies that they run and they're kind of you know they're trailblazers they're leaders in the industry so when you took a look at um Fortescue what do you see yeah so I, I took a look at two people just for the purposes of this episode but I looked at the chairman and the CEO so chairman Dr Andrew Twiggy Forrest uh also the founder he's just sort of phenomenal business person and learning a bit more about his story just from an entrepreneurial and leadership point of view is really interesting as well. And so he took the company from inception, really had a crazy idea um, and really made it one of the largest companies in Australia and listed the company um, and has really built it into what it is today. And now he has stepped back from the day-to-day -day running and he's still the chairman, but he's also running a whole heap of uh, philanthropic endeavors and working on a whole heap of other um, climate change related issues that we'll, we'll touch on later, but he also um, recently, I think it was 2019, got his PhD in marine ecology um, and is really passionate now on ocean conservation. And if you have a listen to the 2020 Boyer lectures that he did with ABC, uh, the first one he talks about some of the stuff he's done with Fortescue, but the second one he talks about uh, the issues with ocean um, contamination and how to uh, work on conservation issues there. So that's quite an interesting talk to listen to. And then on the CEO point of view, so this is a woman who's running the day-to-day -day operations of Fortescue, uh, Elizabeth Gaines. And so 
She's been involved in the company for quite a while, um, firstly as a non-executive director, a CFO, uh, and now she's the CEO and managing director. Um, and she's more of, I don't know if you'd call her a career CEO of sorts, because she has, hasn't always worked in the mining industry. She hasn't always worked at Fortescue, but she's been the CEO of some other large companies like Hello World um, and also a Stellar Group, which when I had a look at it, um, supplied in-flight entertainment to a large number of global airlines. Um, and she also has um, commerce degree, masters of applied finance, bit like you, Owen, um, but she's also got an honorary doctorate of commerce from Curtin University and she's had non-executive director roles at Next DC, Mantra Group, Nine Entertainment and Impedimed. So she's had quite a lot of um, corporate, executive and board experience within Australian and international companies. Mm. So it's not, it's not, well, I'm going to use a double negative. Oh, geez. It's not uncommon. So it, it can, you know, it can happen from time to time that you get a company like Fortescue, which is a mining company, um, well, basically mining or logistics company, whichever way you want to think about it, um, that has a CEO that comes from a slightly different industry. So this is uh, quite common because sometimes those CEOs bring new ideas to an industry that needs to be kind of changed in a way for the better. So this happens um, quite a fair bit. Uh, one of the things that we do like and one of the things that many investors like about Fortescue is that um, as chairman and as founder, Andrew Forrest through Mindaroo, uh, which is holding company, owns around about nearly 30% of the, the overall company. So at 30%, he basically has control of the board. Um, shareholders love it from, a, from an alignment perspective because obviously Fortescue pays billions of dollars in dividends in, and he earns billions of dollars in dividends too. So he wants Fortescue to be a success as much as any of us would want it to be a success as shareholders. So from an alignment perspective, that makes sense. Um, as we've noted here, we've only looked at two of the, well, you've only looked at two of the people on, on, in the company. Um, Nev Powell was another executive before Elizabeth Gaines, who had a massive influence in the company. Um, you know, you can go back to our um, Shares Month ep episodes, which where we looked at Disney. We took a really good look at Disney and what that company does to get a better understanding of how we would look more deeply at companies. But for today, we're just going through kind of like the fast facts of Fortescue. So um, as we said before, the, the company's primary customers are in China. We'll get to some of the financials in a second. If you're watching this video, I can share my screen and you will see that. Um, and the another thing that um, Fortescue is, is striving towards is kind of this ESG focus, so environmental, social and governance impact. Um, and, and in basically improving the way its operations run from a human point of view and, and planet point of view. Fortescue has always been, in my opinion, a very, very strong advocate for social kind of equality and for social rights. So, you know, empowering um, the Indigenous population as well with lots of jobs. Um, also, you know, gender equality and those types of things as well. So they've always been very, very strong and, and advocates in that regard, which you know, we, you could probably say more about them than you can about many of the other mining companies. So that's a positive. And the most recent thing is this shift towards um, an environmental focus for the company. So Kate, I know you have some, some facts and figures here from the website. So I'll let you finish this part off and then maybe we can have a look at the financials. Yeah, so most people know Fortescue as an iron ore mining slash logistics company, but what they started to do a couple of years ago was introduce... Uh, another arm of the business called Fortescue Future Industries, which is focusing on green energy production uh, through renewable sources. And that's um, one of the main focuses that um, Andrew Forrest uh, has been talking about a lot recently and generating a bit of interest and buzz for is producing green hydrogen. Um, and they're also working on a lot of ways to make sure their current mining operations are carbon neutral by, I think it was 2030 as well. Um, so he's working a lot in trying to not only make his current business more uh, energy efficient and less um, contributing less to the environmental issues because the production of like the mining process and production of steel contributes a lot to um our climate change issues but he's also trying to focus on well we need energy we need steel we need to produce all of these things to keep growing and keep our economy going but how can we do this in a better way and so 
he's been, I was just reading through some various press releases, but he's been working on different ways to um, power his vehicles and mining equipment in a way that's a lot more energy efficient or using renewable sources in as many places as possible. And so this company actually has quite a clear climate change strategy from reducing emissions, working with other stakeholders, and they're actually working quite closely with the clients um, around the world that they want to partner with in producing this green hydrogen, um, not only um, in a business point of view, but they're also looking at things like, are the, is there slavery in that country? Are people being paid a fair wage? Is there child marriages? So they're looking at some other social issues as well, along with that, and trying to bring other companies with them as they grow. And so they've got a range of very, um, I don't know, they're like quite, uh, they've set themselves a really high standard and set themselves some really challenging targets to reach in terms of creating this hydrogen. And if you want to learn a bit more about uh, green hydrogen and the role it's going to play, um, well, at least according to Fortescue and Andrew Forrest, um, listening to his Boyer lecture, the first one is a really good place to start. Yeah, it's tremendous. So we'll put, put a link in the show notes. Um, a really, really good 30 minute listen. Um, you don't, you can do something else while you do it. You can cook your dinner or make your cup of coffee. It's a really interesting listen. Uh, and one of the things that he points out is basically um, that at best, the kind of in the less than the next 50 years, the world is looking at a three degree uh, Celsius increase in average temperatures. So um, due to climate change, and that's obviously going to have devastating impacts. It's going to mean basically lots of parts of Australia becomes more arid. Um, we're going to have more bushfires. Sea levels are going to rise in certain places. And, you know, from an ecology perspective, it's going to be devastating as well. So um, basically they've worked out, you know, given Twiggy's background, this doesn't surprise me. They've worked out that there's a big problem and they're going to try and solve it. Um, and they're going to start with themselves in that Boyer lecture. He talks about spending five months overseas during COVID with his team contracting COVID um, and being overseas uh, and trying to push the case with different countries around the world. Um, and so it's a really ambitious move. And it's a really like having read the, the book on Twiggy, I, I, I think it's just like another kind of why not? You know, he's very thick skinned and has dealt with that um, kind of pressure and scrutiny over many years. Um, he started many things that have failed, but many things have been a success too. So mm. uh, really exciting stuff. Um, check out the Boyer, Boyer lecture. We'll jump now into the financials. I might even share my screen really quick if I can. Yeah. Um, we're trying to make these a bit shorter, but um, yeah, we'll see how we go. Okay. Kate, let me know when you can see my screen. Oh, I can see some trees. Yes. As you can see, you can see some trees. Interesting. Okay. So um, for those of you that are listening and not watching, I will... Um, explain it as I go, but here we are just on the RAS Media site um, where Jazz has written about uh, Fortescue and the future industries part of the business. It's a really interesting part of the business. Um, you'll see some other articles on our website if you want to learn more. Um, there's a stalk for Kate uh, that's not meant to be there. So basically, um, let's just go through some good and bad. First of all, we talk about um, you know Fortescue selling iron ore. So Fortescue's business is selling iron ore. There's no you know, if but maybe it's about that, almost 95% of its revenue comes just from iron ore. They're, they make some some money from things like um, their rail networks and, and that type of stuff where other companies, I guess, can use that rail network to earn and they can earn revenue from that. So that's a big, big thing in um, the Pilbara and in WA is like basically rights for railways. And um, one of the things there is that Fortescue has one of the best railways uh, in the country and indeed the world for shipping or for, 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 for freight. So um, other companies try and petition the government to, to get use of that. And um, it's Fortescue's asset. Anyway, so iron ore prices, as you can see on this trading economics chart, um, that basically iron ore fluctuates dramatically. So we've seen in the last few years that since basically the bottom of 2020, which is when, when COVID was around, iron ore prices have shot through the roof. Um, rising from below $100 to over $200 a ton. And so why is that important? Well, the reason that's important is that if you look at Fortescue's financials, you will realize that on average, it costs, I believe, uh, where is my number? So it costs $13, this is in US dollars, $13 per ton for Fortescue to dig the ore out of the ground and ship it. Now, this is the cash cost 
Um, so this doesn't include all of the costs, but it's just basically the most appropriate cost to measure, basically the cost of extraction and putting it on the, the train and all that. And so if you're selling iron ore for $200 and it costs you $13, obviously you have a massive, massive profit margin. And so if prices go higher, iron ore prices go higher, Fortescue makes a lot of money. If iron ore prices fall, Fortescue makes a lot less money. So in the past, we talked about Disney and obviously Disney owns Marvel and Avengers and all that sort of stuff. Disney controls the price that it sets for all of those different things. But for Fortescue, it does not control the price that's set by the market. So that's an important distinction. Um, and it's very important because it makes it harder for you as an investor to forecast. Okay, so here we go. We've got the, um, the results from Fortescue. Uh, I'll just come back up the top to so you can see what it looks like. So this is an annual report, just like any other annual report from, from Fortescue or any other company. Um, you can see at a glance, we've got uh, basically what the company did in the last 12 months. So 182 million tons of iron ore shipped, um, just under $14, I should say, of C1 cash costs. Um, we've got cash on hand of 6.9 US billion. Um, it's got some debt. So the net debt as the net cash is only 2.7. And uh, it made a huge profit of $10.3 billion. Okay, so let's start with some, some, I guess, the bad. The bad is that iron ore prices impact Fortescue's profit. I said that over the last year, profits were huge because iron ore prices were very, very high. Um, another thing, that, some of the reasons why that happened is because of COVID, because of issues with um, South American supply, so from Vale, um, from demand basically uh, coming online. More recently, we've seen prices fall as things like the Evergrande uh, issue with property in China is playing out, um, as there's talk of you know more or less development in certain areas throughout Asia, um, and as supply is continuing to come on board. One of the big projects that people are aware of is Samandu, which is in Guinea, I believe. And basically that's a massive iron ore project that looks like it can supply iron ore to China for pretty cheap. So that's something that the industry is also aware of. Uh, if we jump into the, I'm just going to use a bit of a shorthand notation here. You'll notice if you're watching that I press command F on this PDF, which makes, means that I can just find something really quick. And it's typed in segment info. So segment information, this is in the, if you go into annual report, this is in the notes. So it's past the actual statements, like the cash flow, the balance sheet, all that stuff. And you actually find where the company's making its money and how it's doing that. And you'll see here that revenue from customers uh, is shown and China um, accounts, so Chinese customers accounts for $20 billion of the total $22 billion. So basically are all of the iron ore revenue. And then it's got another note down the bottom here that says revenue from two customers um, was 2.2 billion and 1.9 billion. Um, and I did the numbers and that means that 18% of Fortescue's revenue comes from just two customers um, and over 90% comes from China. So that is either a risk or it's an opportunity depending on how you see it. I see it as a risk to have so much concentration into one thing. Uh, in the past, people have said that Fortescue was not ethical because of its environmental impact in terms of like areas in WA where there may have been some damage uh, in terms of it's, you know, just basically mining and you know, all the things that come with that from an ethical perspective. Um, I think another thing that's to be mindful of is Fortescue's financial growth is kind of not limited, but it's, um, it's basically, how do I put this? It's basically subject to increasing um, production while prices stay at a reasonable level. So in the past, uh, in the past year, they've brought on board a new iron ore facility, um, which will bring more supply but obviously prices need to stay high for them to earn a good margin. The other thing um, is that some of the competitors also have very low costs. So um, BHP and Rio Tinto have extremely low costs as well. On the plus side, we can talk about dividends. So at the very top of the annual report here, it's no surprise on page one of 169, they made mention of dividends because they were huge. $3.58 in, in fully frank dividends, Kate. Thank you very much. Um, it was a, a pretty great year for sh people that were shareholders. There were some very happy people, including uh, Andrew Forrest himself, who had a, a billion dollar dividend, wasn't it? <laughs> Something crazy. Yeah, so, so this is interesting. So, so we know that the dividend was $3.58, right? If we figured out how many shares they he, he held through Mindaroo, we would know. So um, it looks like they've got, what is it, about 918 million shares? I'm just doing this on the fly multiplied by $3.58, it looks like over $3 billion. 
Um, yeah, there was definitely news articles about it, so you can probably find out the, the more accurate yeah. numbers as well. <laughs> yeah, so it could be, let's just say it could be over $3 billion in four-year dividends, which is incredible. Um, now, I want to bring up one word of warning here. Many people have wrote into us and our analyst team and said, well, basically, hey, Fortescue's got this massive dividend. Why don't you buy the shares? Because if you look at Fortescue, and I'll bring it up on Rest Media here, if you look at the share price over the last little while, you'll see that in July 2021, the share price was over $20, and now it's below 15 So it's fallen a long way. And what happens is when a share price falls really quickly like that, the dividend yield looks huge because the way your stock brokerage account calculates the dividend yield is based on last year's dividend that's already been paid, not necessarily what's coming up in the future. So when I looked at the numbers, um, it looks like analysts are forecasting $1.77 in full year dividends next year. Um, so down from $3.58. So it would be at quite a bit lower. It's still probably a good yield if it gets paid, but obviously it's all subject to iron ore. So keep that in mind. If iron ore prices stay high, then Fortescue probably should pay a dividend. But if iron ore prices fall, then there might be in a bit of trouble. Okay, so some other positives um, is that the company is in a net cash uh, position. So um, cash at bank. So basically, if you if you look, you can see it's got $5.4 billion of cash at bank and $1.4 billion of deposits, which totals $6.9 billion of cash in the bank. However, the company also has debt. So when we get to a net cash figure, we basically take, it's like if you owned a property, you know, what's your equity? Well, it's basically you take what you have that's yours, which is your cash, $6.9 billion in the case of Fortescue, and you deduct any debt. In this case, um, there's $4 billion of debt. So it's $2.9 billion um, of net cash. So that's a good thing. There were times in the past where I didn't buy Fortescue shares because I was worried about how much debt it had. It used a lot of debt to build those railways and buy the ships and everything. Um, so final point I'll add on here is um, that basically Fortescue is making this massive move with this um, future industries business and basically taking everything to be autonomous and also to be green. That might result in higher costs in the short term, but over the long term, that could be a significant opportunity for Fortescue, which could lead to more revenue and more profits in time. So really interesting there. Um, and if I had, if I was so cheeky to add one final one on here, Kate, I would say that um, obviously another positive is uh, having such alignment from a founder. Yeah. And I think that was mo the most interesting part for me looking at Fortescue going from not really knowing anything about the company to now having like a, a broad awareness of, of what it does and what they're aiming to do over the next few decades with their uh, green hydrogen projects. And it really, it does make you think about it from a sort of a values-based or an ESG point of view, because I mean, typically a lot of people would say mining um, doesn't fall within that category, um, fall within their ESG filters. But you're also, if you're looking at what the company could do in the future, and as we've mentioned before, like investing in the future you want to see, it is taking a really extreme position with their um, extreme and ambitious and maybe courageous almost um, trying to build this green energy project. And so um, I think it, it's quite an interesting one to think about just from that values point of view is um, even if maybe you don't really like what the company is doing right now, do you like what it's attempting to do in the future? Mm. And this is the thing, you know, um, this is where it can be very polarizing, the ethical stance, the values-based investing because what you end up having is a, a company that I think they, and they confess this, which is brilliant of them, that it to produce one ton of iron ore it costs 1.9 tons in carbon. Um, and so, you know, they are a company that knows we still need to make roads. We still need to make hospitals. We still need to make houses. We still need to make all these things that we use, but we can do it in a much, much more efficient way and so the way to do that is basically to use better sources of energy. And um, for those of you that don't know, to make steel, you can't just do it out of purely out of iron ore. You also have to use coal. And so removing some of that coal from the process is a, is a really positive thing. Um, and Fortescue's plan, which is really interesting, um, if you listen to that Boyer lecture, Fortescue's plan isn't to basically say, sorry, coal workers, and sorry, everyone in the coal, 
you're out of a job. It's actually to basically redistribute those skilled workers into the same jobs, but in a hydrogen focused um, mining sector here in Australia. So it's a really they interesting employ a thing. huge number of Australians. Like they create a lot of jobs, this company. So you don't really just want it to evaporate, but what they're trying to do is like create jobs in new areas to move people into those industries. Yeah. And this is the thing where some people who are at the extreme end of kind of the ethical and environmental awareness, um, they would suggest that all mining is bad mining. Um, whereas someone maybe like Fortescue's that take on it is we need mining. How do we make it so it's optimal for the environment? Um, and so that's their take on it. And this is why we've always said, Kate, that ethical investing is not what you or I think. It's what we each think individually. So sustainable investing might be a different thing because you can measure carbon, but you can't measure ethics. Like you can't just measure that, but you can measure carbon. And so um, they're, they're slightly different things. But from an ethical perspective, it basically comes back to what you're comfortable with. Um, you know, I don't see the government in Australia doing much for climate in, in this respect. So if I was trying to vote with my wallet, I, had, I would like to back people that um, want to make change. Um, even if they're coming from an industry that does use royalties and does use, you know, Australia's resources and whatever, um, the sooner we can get to carbon kind of neutral, the better. So, it, it, you know, there's an argument to be made for and against Fortescue being an ethical investment. It's not really us to pass, I guess, that judgment, but um, really interesting company anyway, Fortescue. If you want to know more about Fortescue, you can head to RAS Media. Um, that's rasmedia.com.au. We can find out more. There's been a lot of coverage on it from Jazz Harrison, in particular, one of our writers um, covering the company and its, and its future industries business. Um, you can write into us too at podcast at rast.com.au if you want to, uh, us to look at a company in the future. It doesn't have to be a mining company. It doesn't have to be an ESG focused kind of company. It can be anything. Um, we'll, we'll try and do this once a month, either with an ETF or a share. If you like this episode, jump into the Facebook community. That's um, on, you know, on Facebook, it's at Rask Australia Facebook community. You can share your thoughts and tell us what you think of Fortescue. There are a lot of opinions on Twitter. I, I noticed yesterday when I put out a tweet. Um, so yeah, tell us what you think. It's a really interesting business. We're not here to say buy, hold or sell. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to bring awareness to this industry, this company. Um, I don't own shares. Kate doesn't own shares, although our ETFs and our super funds may. So for full disclosure. Kate? Mm, but I definitely think it's a company for the watch list. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's, a, I, personally, I think it's having a look at it again. I think it's, yeah, definitely one for the watch list. So uh, further research is warranted in my opinion. So yeah, and wonderful. you've got to commend companies where the founders are actually taking an active interest in the, the issues that we're facing in our world and maybe trying to do something about it, even if it does sound a little bit crazy. And sometimes the best ideas come from sound crazy to start with, but they actually end up working. Yeah, Twiggy in particular cops a lot of shit and he has his whole life for for doing for taking on bold things um and so if there's anyone any kind of entrepreneur in australia that would probably see it succeed um it would probably be him so it's really really interesting um you can say what you want about the, the business and the sector the mining sector in general but uh really really fascinating so definitely one for the watchers for me kate as always thanks so much for taking the time to join me and listeners on this deep dive into fortescue middle Group. Yeah. Great to learn about a new industry. <laughs>